You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your murder mystery world tour. And Herds. Flex. We have just walked out of the theatre not minutes ago. It's true. I'm still sweaty from the exit uh, procedure. <laughs> it's a very involved <laughs> procedure. It is. That's how it is these days. Movie theatres are intense scenes. We have seen Kenneth Branagh's yep. Death on the Nile, the follow-up to 2017's Murder on the Orient Express, starring the director himself oh my goodness. as Hercule Poirot. It's ridiculous. Can I say out the gate, Flex, before we talk about the plot, the mystery, the characters, yes. I just want to say that we spent last evening watching the Murder on the Orient Express adaptation that yes. Kenneth Branagh is also the criminal responsible for. <laughs> and I wanted to say that this was a much better movie. It was way better. I, I won't have any comments, it's, uh, too many comments about the Orient yeah. Express adaptation and what a train wreck that was, pun intended. Pun intended. Pun intended. But I genuinely enjoyed Death on the Nile. Yeah, yeah. I had a great time. I should say, I want to keep spoilers out for like the next Good. five minutes or so. We'll let you know when we're going to ease them back in. But let's just first of all talk, I guess, about the style of adaptation that this is. Yeah. Because I think that Murder on the Orient Express, and this is the one main comparison I want to make. I mean, it's the, it's the only comparison. <laughs> Murder on the Orient Express played very by the book and added a few things in and made Poirot seem a little dumb and goofy. And angry. This plays less by the novel. They cut characters, which they didn't do as much in Murder in the Orient Express. Uh, they've changed a couple of the details about who is who, for example. Like, there's two characters rolled into one. There are new characters. Yeah, Lynette's yeah. cousin Andrew sure. is like a, a jumbling together of two other characters from the book, one of them also named Andrew. But I think that Kenneth Branagh kind of found home with his portrayal in this one, where it feels like the liberties they took with the adaptation are finally playing their own song rather than striking wrong notes in the original story. Yeah, I mean, Poirot, as I, as I said, like in the Orange Express adaptation, he was a very angry character. And yeah. I think that they've carried, like rather than perhaps pushing back against people who might think that's a little out of character for for Poirot to get angry and up in people's faces. Yeah. Uh, it's it's maybe not doubling down, but like you can see that characterization uh, being embraced in the follow-up, in the follow-up movie, yes. which I think is really cool. Um, I, I didn't 100% vibe with, uh, with, with Poirot as a character in this one. There are definitely some of the, the jokes that they kind of made throughout the film that I think were made five too many times. Mm -hmm. His little tangents, I think got me a little bit under yeah. the skin. But I do think that uh, the liberties that you, that, as you said, that they're taking with with Poirot, and also an incredibly strong supporting cast, uh, including uh, Mr. Le, Le Bouc, who yes. returns in this film from the be, Orient Express, which the is Orient the only Express book movie. he's in. Yes, normally he's not in the Death of the Nile story, but they brought him in to uh, perform as part of the 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 set and the characters, yeah. which I thought was really good. He he replaces Colonel Race, who is in a few other Poirot yeah, stories. And he, is, he essentially plays as a Watson in this story, which I thought was actually really really inspiring. And the way yeah. that he ties into the themes of the story was really well done. Yeah, I think this film does a really good job of taking some of the subtext of the original novel, which is a bit of what yeah. you're referring to there, making it text mm -hmm. and doing it in a way that doesn't feel like they're condescending to the audience, which is rare and I appreciate it. Yeah, I definitely felt that the uh, the tussle back and forth of the thematics that are, that are in this story, I think they were really well acted and written. Mm. And I definitely felt that though... There are a lot of elements of the story of the mystery. There were some clues, which because I, I have never read the the book Death on the Nile. I have, but well, he it, Flex has, but I have not. And there was one clue in particular, which th there's a line that you're like, why would you even feel the need to say that out loud? <laughs> Obviously, that's the clue that leads us to the killer and yeah. the, and the the real you know the 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 secret that's going on here. Um, and I feel that way similarly about the the thematic content, but I think that enough time was paid. Uh, and enough care was taken with the characters and their mm. personal journeys that that really, that really sang by the time you get to the end of the film. Yeah, the last thing I want to address before we jump into spoilers here yeah. is that the performances across the board are, great. Are, are, are really good. Yeah, There's none of them that like stand out and make me want to highlight them, no. but they all play the roles well. They all take their own spin on it, you know, playing to some of the tropes, putting their own little twists and turns in here. Uh, there's one character who particularly has a musical sting when they appear every time, or so almost silly. every time on screen. And it's so great. silly. It's great. <laughs> So many silly details in this film. I love that. You know, if you're going in expecting a faithful Christie adaptation, you will be disappointed. But if you mm. take this film on its own merits, yeah. I think it is very good. It's a good film. Spoilers. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I I kind of hinted at a little bit ago that I enjoyed the thematic content. Yeah. And 
honestly, this was the best part because as I was sitting there trying to figure out who's the killer, I, as I often do, I was leaning more on the themes of the story and how so many characters say throughout the film, you know, what will you do for love? What is the price that you will pay, right? Well, let's let's set this up, first of all, by going to the first scene on the film, which sure, shows Poirot sure. during World War One showing birds flying in the sky oh as goodness. evidence for what time his troop should attack so stupid. under the cover of smoke. <laughs> and it I... goes well, but then his commander ignores a tripwire and just about kills the unit it's anyway. such a silly opening. I don't, I'll be honest, I think you enjoyed it more than I did. I thought it was the most possible ridiculous way. Like, his captain might as well have said, you shouldn't be a farmer. You should be a detective. Oh, I've killed myself. Here, have my mustache. Like, yeah. Well, that's that's yeah. That's the thing that they set up is that the mustache, which is not the traditional Poirot mustache that yep. uh, Kenneth Branagh has, is his captain's mustache <sighs> from that film sequence, which is a little ridiculous. They could have, you know, so it, silly. It doesn't disabuse them of picking the wrong Poirot mustache. However, it is nonetheless a cool detail of this Poirot story. And then, of course, it goes into the uh, the love, uh, Catherine, and her visiting him in hospital. And that character dies off screen when her train is struck by a mortar. Mm. And Poirot, basically, in this situation, looking at his friend Book falling in love, looking mm. at this marriage falling apart. Yep. And all of these characters the are accusing yeah. him of being cold and calculating and not understanding why they're doing these things for love. I think that they did a surprisingly compelling job pitching that aspect of Poirot's character and why he is so cold and calculating against the rest of the cast. Yeah. And then, of course, because this is a murder mystery, because the criminal is a super genius that plots and plans everything, you then flip that on its head and other people are being cold and calculating and that's what Poirot can see. Yes, the, the balance that we've got here, and th this is why I, I would recommend this to, to people to watch because it's it's often it's very easy to to create a uh, a contrast between you know the detective and the criminal by simply saying they're both equally calculating masterminds yeah, and they yeah. have a similar tragic backstory. There's all sorts of tropes you can lean on, but the balancing act that this film kind of pulls and, and to my understanding the book pulled in its subtext, which is now made text, they're introducing the idea of order versus chaos, yeah. which is obviously a tie in, you know, it's, it's a trope, but like the, the chaos of boot to the order of Poirot and the way in which he uses his emotion to fuel his detective efforts in the same way that the, you would call them emotional yeah. uh, villains, use their cold and calculating reason to carry out the plan. Here's the other cool right? thing about this, right? Is that the whole reason that Book and Poirot work so well as this film, as you say, is that it's the orderverse chaos of yes. Book being this crazy guy and I Poirot mean, being very ordered. But, you know, Watson and Sherlock. Poirot's, <laughs> uh, quote, love interest, who's yes. the jazz singer, who is originally in the book, but they didn't have a, like, arc going on there. She was a great character, by the way. That line, which he's like, if I wanted to put a bullet in every white woman who'd wronged me, like, they'd all be dead. They'd yeah, be that, done. That'd be a long trail. <laughs> exactly. But the thing that's really nice about the way they set their relationship up is that she and Poirot sit down and have a discussion. Poirot is basically like, what do you think of the guy? And she says, basically, she, she describes Poirot's relationship with Book. She brought so, so many orderly men and so many men set to achieve something, yes. but I like this guy more. Yeah, the lawyer and the baron, all of whom could have brought, you know, fame and richness, yeah. but this guy's great. <laughs> this and guy's good of character. I thought that know? was really good. The other really interesting twist that they made, they made Marie, who's the godmother of the victim, oh, yes. Lynette, they made her a, a communist, which was like fantastic. It's fantastic <laughs> <laughs> because the, the whole setup is is that she has a maid, and mm -hmm. uh, you know the the twist ends up being that the reason that she keeps a maid despite being a communist is because they're actually together. Was that a in the book? Or no, could, I didn't did think Christy so. Wright lesbians. I, look, I well, that's Christy why I, asked. <laughs> I wanted to double check because I assumed if they, if that was the case in the book, then they'd be dead by the end of the novel. In the book, mm -hmm. Marie stole a fake copy of the necklace that Book steals oh, in this film. So they right. replaced her arc of being a kleptomaniac <laughs> with her being a communist lesbian and Book stole in the real necklace instead. It sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. I'm pretty big into that. And yeah, there's like there's a there's a bunch of interesting changes like that, but Again, taken on their own merits, I thought they were all really great. And the main problem that I've consistently have with Kenneth Branagh's Poirot, like mm. I can accept that his adaptation of Poirot is different. I think he's just too angry, personally. Yeah, but they replace <laughs> so many moments of Poirot being clever with yes. him being stern. Yeah, I, I don't know how I feel about that particular solution. You know, like yeah. they're trying to say this isn't the Poirot that you know. The way that Poirot gets results is by shouting at people until they get so scared that they just admit everything they've done wrong. Yeah, very strange. Anyway, I think in in general. 
before we go in to discuss the mystery, I can recommend this film, but go in expecting to see a retelling of Death of the Nile rather than perhaps a direct adaptation. Which I mean, is that's fine. good. That's good for yeah. adaptations. We shouldn't expect them to be the same. No, absolutely. Anyhow, let's wrap this up. We will come back at the end of the show to discuss the mystery in a bit more depth. Mm. I'm excited for this. We are discussing Kenneth Branagh's adaptation of Death on the Nile by Agatha Christie, starring Kenneth Branagh himself as Poirot. We'll be back on your Murder Mystery World Tour in just a second. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour here on 2SER 107.3. Flex and Herds here. While we were talking at Murder Mystery on screen at the moment, we wanted to talk and draw your attention to a awesome Australian project, The Art of Murder. Joining us now on Death of the Reader are Narali and Anoki from Chalk Chip Animation Studios, the folks behind this murder mystery musical known as The Art of Murder. Welcome to the show. It's so good to have you. Thank you so much. It's so it's so nice to be on. Thank you so much for inviting us and for your interest in the project. Yes. It's- Thanks so much for having us on. We're so excited to talk to you guys more about The Art of Murder and tell you more about the project. Awesome. So there's been another like resurgence in mysteries on screen lately from satires like Will Arnett's Murderville through Kenneth Branagh's Poirot and Ryan Johnson's Knives Out. What drew you to the genre? And do you think there's a common thread to why we see so many of them at the moment? Well, we've always loved... um murder mysteries of course and we've also always loved like musicals and we thought about like what would be a unique take on a murder mystery and we always thought it would lend itself really well to the um or not uh we always thought it would be like really unique in the um scenario of like one of those grandiose musicals just because it's not something that you see too often um you know so like because murder mysteries are so like dialogue based and character driven and then with broadway musical styles numbers you have like that big grandiose um more like visual nature of it and we just thought it would be really cool to um bring those two uh genres together so i guess what drew us to murder mysteries in general is because like we just we we really love them and yeah. we also wanted to find a different like spin that we could put on it especially in the context of animation and just something, bring something new to the genre. Yeah, I've been kind of wondering about the bold choice because I've, I've watched the announcement trailer uh, and there's this kind of bold choice to tie yourself directly to like modern internet animation culture. I saw homages to the surprisingly adult themed animated show Adventure Time and there was a very brazen use of the term OC right at the end of the trailer. Not a word you hear very often. Um, what what emboldened you to kind of embrace the the internet fandom, the internet culture uh, aspect of the story, and how does being you know independent creators give you the freedom to take this approach? Yeah, well, like Narali said before, like uh, we knew we had always wanted to do a murder mystery musical, but we wanted to find a really unique and interesting take on the genre that hadn't really been seen in the industry that much, and especially not in animation. And so then that was like the first layer that we were going for, and then. That's when um, we were like, well, what do we really want to see in this genre? And what's a really unique take that we would just love to watch? And then that's when that pop culture element came in as the second layer. Because, yeah, it's probably just everything that we love. Yeah, it's everything that we love and all the shows and fandoms that we love um, and that we wanted to celebrate. So the whole episode is really like a celebration and almost a love letter to pop culture in itself of everything that we love. And um, we wanted to celebrate the people behind pop culture from the creators to like the audiences that also help to bring the shows to life and celebrate them in the communities. I love the the love letter approach. I mean, it's obviously a project that is, it's such a work of, of passion, right? And it's a very ambitious project. I saw you've got a lot of other, you know, independent creators working. Uh, and you mentioned that it's, you know, the part of the thesis of the project is having all these shared voices all working together. Um, I, I wanted to, to ask, what was the process like coordinating all of those those people for the two of you? Um, and what were some of the exciting changes that have actually happened to the project as a result of some of these other voices? Look, well, look, we feel like incredibly lucky to be working with so many amazing people from like Sonia and Jonah, our composers um, who brought all the songs to life to all the voice actors who, um, you know, lended their talents to the project, to all the artists we're working with. We've just been incredibly lucky to work with um, so many amazing people who want to bring this vision to life as well. And we're incredibly grateful. Um, in terms of the project, uh, the process of um, bringing everyone together, it was mostly um, like uh, talking to them and p- like pitching the project to them, explaining the concept to them. 
Um, and we've been incredibly lucky that everyone was really enthusiastic about the project and wanted to help bring it to life. And we're so grateful that everybody believed in the vision that we have and has you know, helped us to bring it to life. Something we've spoken about on this show a bunch is how like murder mystery toys with the game of identity. You mentioned Pip, who's the artist character whose drawings like form the body of the cast here. What do you think people can learn about themselves through the art of creating in what they love? Like, you know, you mentioned many of your team created drawings and then went on to make their own going from like fan to original creation. What can you learn about yourself in that process? Do you think? I think that like as an artist, um, Every like, I think so many artists go through the same um, childhood of like you start by copying the things that you love. So I think everyone will have the same experience of like um, taking a picture exactly as you see it and like trying to draw it accurately. So like I remember for me personally, I would draw like fan art of like Card Captor Sakura and Sailor Moon, especially <laughs> I have like sketchbooks and sketchbooks <laughs> with like and Pokemon as yeah. well and like the same characters over and over <laughs> yeah. again as well. Mm-hmm. And then you like from there, you kind of branch out, like you try and draw the characters, um, not exactly copying an exact picture, but then trying to draw them from your own imagination. And then from there, the step further is like um, drawing your own characters. And I think what happens is that the characters that you draw for yourself end up being a culmination of everything that you love. Like I know my art style right now has like aspects of Disney and aspects of anime, aspects of like Ghibli. It's kind of everything that has influenced me and I think as artists that's what happens to a lot of us is that our art style ends up being a culmination of everything that we love so it's kind of our identity in a way yeah you, you've spoken a lot about you know there's all these different animation styles and all these voice actors and all these music being produced um obviously you've, you've had to work remotely with with a lot of your team um did you take that as an opportunity to kind of keep the the murder mysteries hidden you know the, the, the plots and the back and forth, uh, kind of hidden uh, from, from some of them too? Or, or was it important that everyone was on the same page uh, for, your, for your workflow across the creative team? That's, a, that's kind of interesting because I, I, like our crew on the project have had like so many um, theories about who the murderer is. Ah, and we should, yes. That's fantastic. We haven't uh, revealed it to too many people. Voice the voice actors, actors know, all the voice the voice actors actors know. know who the murderer is. Apart from that, we've um, everyone's had a lot of fun guessing who they like think it is and all the different theories, which I think is one of the best parts of a meta mystery is like kind of going along with the characters and getting to guess and explore yourself and solve it as you go along. Yeah, I, I guess the last thing that I wanted to touch on is when you were talking with our friend Ruby over at Kotaku Australia, which we'll link up on the podcast if anyone listening is curious, you spoke about how Ch- Chuck Chip Studios was partially born out of the disappointment of like Disney closing their 2D animation studios and your journey to animation on your own. I guess, how much do you two see of yourselves in Pip? And was it kind of hard to like separate that and make her her own character? How much of that voice is yours, do you think? Um, I think, I think it's, that's a good question, actually. I think it's very much, um, I think I see a lot of myself in Pip, but also just like, it's a culmination of like so many artists experience around that age. And there's also like specific quirks from me that I've like that are brought in and that, but that's also kind of um, true for all artists. Like very early on in the episode, you we learned that like Pip can't really draw. She has trouble drawing hands. It's not really a spoiler. It happens in the first <laughs> Good. She so draws in her pockets. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think it'd be more of a spoiler to find out the opposite because every artist just went, oh yeah, screw hands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, all artists hate. So like, and so what I meant was like, I always have, well, I had trouble drawing hands. That was like the thing I had the most trouble with. But I think it's mm-hmm. what most artists had trouble with. We really wanted people to almost like project themselves onto Pip. Like she's a vehicle for people to kind of connect to this world that we're trying to create. So I think, yeah, that's a lot of our voices in Pip. And we hope that other people find that in Pip as well and are able to kind of, yeah, just project themselves onto her. I love that. It's it's art made for artists specifically. I love it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that is incredibly fantastic. I love that final pitch you made there, Herds. Art for Thank artists. You. I'm all about it. My goodness, thank you so much to you two, Narali and Anoki, for coming on Death of the Reader. We are so excited for the art of murder, and we'll have links up on the podcast if people want to find out more about the project. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much for having us on and for 
um, your interest in the project and like all your kind words about it. It really means so much to us. Yeah. We, yeah. Thank you so much for having us on. It was so lovely like to talk to both of you and share more about the project. So thank you so much. I guess the last thing I have to ask right before we leave is do we have Uh-oh. a release date yet for the first episode or is that still up in the air? Uh, we have, we're aiming for the sometime around mid year, um, but we haven't, announced an exact release date just yet if everyone checks up on our social media and stuff we will be announcing one we'll keep you posted here on our podcast as well because we're definitely super excited if you uh, want to stick around this is death of the reader your murder mystery world tour here on 2ser 107.3 we'll be back in just a second stick around You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are discussing Death on the Nile, starring and directed by Kenneth Branagh from the Agatha Christie novel of the same name. Herds, mm, mm, yeah. What's this is happening? the first time you've seen uh, Death on the Nile. Or well, re- the first time I've experienced the story, yeah. Yeah. And I, I assume you're going to ask me how I found the mystery and Absolutely. how I went solving it. Can I tell you, I actually really enjoyed it. I... Um, I really enjoyed trying to figure out who the, the killer or killers were in this yes. case. We are in spoilers, so let's yes, get into we things. we have full spoilers, so As, be Yeah, because it's, it's a two-hour and 14-minute movie, which means that we spend the first hour and a bit just talking with the characters and getting all the motives and hanging out. Yeah. And I figured out pretty quickly because obviously the opening scene is the um, – the war scene, which we won't talk about that anymore. But after that is this scene in a like a club or a speakeasy or something, whatever it is, uh, where we meet the two lovers who are going to be married. Well, we meet two lovers who are going to be married and then a woman who would split them apart. Yes. And this uh, lovely songstress woman. And then, of course, we get the comment from Bruce's mother. Yes, Euphemia. That's Euphemia who is a new character, I suppose. I'm, I'm kind of curious who gets this line in the book, but she yeah. says, my red paint is gone. And I turned to, to Flex here and I said, red paint? I don't know if you heard me, but I was trying <laughs> to be quiet. Yeah. But at that point, it becomes very clear that the killer is one of the four at the start of the novel, if there even is a killer, and the red paint is being used to cover up a wound, and there are only two wounds presented to us during the actual first kill. Yeah. So... If you take the doctor to not be an accomplice, which was something I was kind of tossing and turning on as we were well, watching the film. Well, there are two doctors as well. There are is- two doctors, but there's a doctor who, uh, you know, first inspects the body. Uh, unfortunately, we see the lady's body several times down in the morgue, and it seems like it would just be stupidity if she weren't dead. So you have to assume that the bullet wound is fake. Yeah. That said, the bullet wound isn't fake. It just was applied later on in the evening. Yeah. I, I believe <laughs> the that Euphemia replaces Miss Allerton, though. Miss Allerton, I don't think, was a painter in the book. And I also don't think that the paint clue is there. Right. The thing I did want to say is that there's that thread that I mentioned of stealing the fake necklace, which ties mm. that crime back <laughs> I, I guess, yeah. a bit better to the one of the boulder being heaped off the top of the tomb. Sure, That sure. one in this film feels completely superfluous. Can I be completely honest with yeah. you? I pretty much ignored the necklace the entire film. I thought, I mean, that's a red herring. <laughs> like, it's not, this isn't a crime of money. Yeah. Everyone's talking about love. It's not going to be a crime for money. Mm. That's not the case at all. Well, yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> I, I think it's fair still having yeah. it there to sure. draw more suspicion I mean, onto the people it, who do want it. It also ties Book in a way. Yeah. And maybe we should get into Book and his f- performance, shall we? Sure. So Book dies. Book dies. Yeah. It's if, if you were fantastic. Not, yeah, if you were not expecting this like I was, it was kind of a gut punch. And we're yeah. sitting in a room with Poirot, Book, and Simon. Yes. And he says, I'm going to interrogate you, Book. I'm going to get the truth out of you. Yeah. I'm, I'm sitting here in the, in the seat eating my popcorn and you know, drinking my soda and thinking, oh, he's going to turn it on Simon. He's going to figure it out in this scene. Well, the, the great but- thing is, right, <laughs> is that Pyro gets terse. He yells like, rubbish at, uh, You're lying at, to at, me. at, at Book. Yeah. And Book, you know, like almost comes to tears being like, don't do this. I don't want to, I don't want to confess. And then Simon says, come on. Simon says. Uh, yeah. A, a gunshot fires. Yep. And Book is shot through the neck. Yeah. And, this is the one moment of performance in the film I did want to talk about that I really loved, which was Poor Kenneth Luke. Branagh going from the stern-looking pyro to looking at his now dead friend and going, Mon ami, fantastic. Yeah, it was I so loved sad. It. it was so good. Like I, I loved that scene because I, I thought, you know, it, it wasn't the suspect lineup, but I thought this is the moment of triumph. This is yeah. when he like figures it out and then uses a piece of evidence from like Simon's interrogation later. But no, it was the moment of tragedy. Well, yeah, because he's basically accusing Book of the crime, obviously, to try and throw Simon off the trail, sure, I think, sure. which is why why he's there in that scene. Mm. 
but the plan goes wrong. And then, of yeah, course- It's, the it's next, not explicitly mentioned, yeah, but yeah. The next time he confronts Book's mother, Euphemia, she's like, you failed everyone. Yes. And then Poirot has this like big, ridiculous, over-the-top triumphant moment of shooting a gun up in the air, all the doors lock, the guests are trapped in, and he's there with a pistol pointing it into the room like, I won't fail again. Yeah. I mean, it all comes down to that balancing act because uh, to wax poetic for a moment, in that final scene- Poirot, Poirot becomes the nexus of logic and emotion. Yes. He is so fueled by grief and regret over his, like, lack of being able to protect his buddy. Yeah. Um, and he's still got those little gray cells pumping. He uses both of those those sides of him yeah. uh, to, to catch the killer in the end. But, yeah, it's great. I, I actually really enjoyed the finale of this film. I I, I think that I, I definitely warmed up to the mystery as we went on, as we discovered all the little clues and saw the red herrings and all the little directions yeah. that the story could go. And it culminates in such a, a, a brutal fashion. The other thing that I did want to talk about that they did better in Murder on the Orient Express, though – I think that has more to do with the source material than the adaptation, is that there were less like, I guess, just on-screen clues. Visual clues, right? Like the the red paint one, I think, is the only real visual clue. And it's a good well, one at that. Did they show us the painting of him in green? Like, did they show it close yes. up? Did they? Several okay. times. I wasn't sure. And, and to their credit, they showed it close up before it was colored in, then showed a scene with him wearing the red jacket, and then showed it colored mm, in green. Oh yeah. So you can tell that I don't care about this. <laughs> like, <laughs> like to put it very bluntly, like I heard them say I'm out of red paint and that was the clue for me. I was yeah. not paying attention to the visual clues because I'm not a very visual person in general. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, such is life. Like the mystery is perfectly enjoyable, I think, uh, even if you don't get to see as many visual clues. Though we did get to see the sandstorm that did nothing. Oh, so God. that was that was good. <laughs> <sighs> Kenneth Branagh, why do you keep just artificially throwing weather events into your that films that do uh, nothing? Can, can I say that just on the topic of visual yeah. moments, I really enjoyed uh, the moment we find the poor maid's body and she's like in the paddle wheel and we and see the, like, her like kicks out the glass. Oh. She like yeah, she like kicks out the glass as she's rattling around in the in like, it's the cage. So, it's so oh, grotesque it's, and it's it also great. physically doesn't really make any sense. It doesn't matter. Anyway. It looked great. Please by all means uh do drop into our social media at Flex and Herds or head up to the 2SCR website, find our contact details up there and let us know what you thought of this film because you know, I, as I've said, I'm a, I'm an enormous fan of David Suchet's adaptation. We had him on the show when we first t- spoke about the Murder on the Orient Express novel. I, I really liked being towed across the line by Kenneth Branagh here. I thought that Murder on the Orient Express was good, uh, was but okay. I walked out of this mil- movie going, that was good. And I'd I, say great. But I'm yeah. glad he towed me across the line. Yeah. Look, I'm glad I saw it. I went into it with the lowest of expectations after the Orient Express. I'm going to admit that, but I was won over. <laughs> oh. One last note. Uh-oh. Uh I was very sad that we only saw the Queen and the Nile costume once for like half a oh, second. Oh yeah, we should we should maybe mention that because like Agatha Christie adaptations are, are somewhat known for their fantastic costumes, and yeah, we we had this moment where they're saying we're going to see the Queen of the Nile, and there she is. There's Gal Gadot her- sat atop a random golden pyramid for for three seconds. For three seconds. I thought maybe she'd get killed in that dress, but then she she steps off the ladder. And that's it. The mystique is ruined that's and that's it's, and it's gone. It's I don't gone. know what happened to that dress. They might have thrown it in the river for all we know. It could <laughs> Actually, still be I mean, down they there. They should have used that instead of the stupid scarf. <laughs> I mean, they could have. <laughs> they could have like, they could have had her like laid out on the bed and she's in the dress and it's all bloody and gold and stuff. That'd be great. Because she died in gold in her riches. Oh, oh she died in her there riches. We go. Oh, I get it. Anyhow, this is Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour here on 2SER 107.3. Thank you very much for joining us for our Death on the Nile film special. Next week on the show, we are covering Abir Mukherjee's The Shadows of Men. It's a thriller novel. So I can't promise you an immense mystery and a lot mm-hmm. of puzzling to do, but while we are still spiritually continuing our quest in India, I think, uh, especially coming off the back of a Vasin Khan novel, the two of them co-host the Red Hot Chili Writers podcast, of course. it would be remiss of us not to visit Abir Mukherjee. So we will be covering chapters 1 to 18 next week on the show. Maybe it'll be a nice break after all those terrifying riddles yeah that was that was kind of the thought there i thought so yeah so this should be good fun i hope you enjoy the uh the, the bit of an abrupt turn that we've taken with this film and now this thriller novel Look, i'm looking forward to a spicy hot chili hot murder mystery if you want to go check out the red hot chili riders we'll drop a link on I the do. podcast <laughs> <laughs> i'm about to check them out right now otherwise we will see you next week with the shadows of men 
This has been your Murder Mystery World Tour here on 2SCR 107.3. See you next time. We'll see you then.